Hey guys, welcome back. Here we are for chapter seven. We're going to dig into weather, climate, and terrestrial biomes, kind of our uh, sections. Right off the bat, our core case study, the African savanna. Why are there grasslands in some areas while there's forests and deserts in others? The savanna is in a tropical environment that's anywhere between zero, the equator, and 30 degrees latitude, north or south. But in that same area, we're going to find tropical rainforests, we're going to find savannas, and we're going to find deserts. So why is that? Well, it's mainly because of climate, which is weather over 30 to 1,000 years, collectively what's been happening. We tend to have three broad climates, if you will. Tropical climates, polar climates at the other end of the planet, and then temperate, the in-between. That's where you and I here in Gainesville, now we're right on the edge of temperate, but we hit more temperate than we do truly tropical. Now the savanna. The savanna only has scattered trees. It's warm, but there's not quite enough rainfall for large organisms. So we find some scattered trees and mainly warm weather. But they tend to go through a wet season and a dry season. They don't really have spring, summer, winter, fall. They talk about their seasons in terms of wet and dry. The savanna is home to a lot of grazing animals. Now these are ones that go around and eat the grass. So like antelope, gazelle, elephants, etc. And browsing animals. Now browsing animals are still herbivores but they're the ones that are eating leaves and twigs, etc. So think giraffes. So they have both the grazing and the browsing, and of course the predators that hunt them. But as is true of most habitats, their loss of habitat is threatening native animals. Because we find out that savannas and grasslands make really good farming areas, and we tend to transplant the animals and the native things that used to live there in favor of farms and farming. 7.1, we're gonna look at weather. The difference between weather and climate is pretty simple. Weather is what's happening right now. Climate is what I expect to be happening. So if somebody says, ooh, we're gonna come visit Florida. What they expect is warm, sunny weather. That's what they'll probably get. But on any given day, they could show up and it could be cool and rainy. So weather is what's happening right now or what we expect to happen next week. Climate is what happens over a long period of time. But we're going to deal in with weather today. Weather is just a set of physical conditions that happening in the lower atmosphere, specifically the troposphere, that lowest area. And it's in a period of hours to days. So we'll talk about weather like what's happening now or what's going to happen this afternoon. Or we may talk about it, ooh, this week we expect to have. But it's a short-term thing. It's dependent upon atmospheric temperature and precipitation. We'll talk about the same thing with climate, but that's really what drives it. We think, how hot is it gonna be? And is it gonna rain, snow, sleet, hail, etc.? Weather is affected by several different things, but very large scope. It's affected by moving masses of either warm or cold air. It's affected by the atmospheric pressure changes. We talk about high pressure or low pressure. And it's also affected by the occasional shifts in wind. Wind tends to blow in large currents, but we do get these occasional shifts and these drastically affect our weather pattern. Let's take a look at this first one. Moving masses of warm or cold air. We call these a front and it's the boundary. It's area right between two distinct air masses which will have different temperatures and densities. We should know density, the mass divided by volume. So it's the amount of particles that you have packed into an area. A bowling ball is denser than a volleyball, has more particles packed in there. Well, cold air is denser, the particles are all closer together, than warm air where they're spread out. So we can talk about low pressure, high pressure. High pressure is going to be denser, things packed together. Low pressure is going to be where the particles are more spread out. We'll talk about masses with different temperatures and densities. So let's talk about a warm front. 
It's a warm front when we have a mass of advancing warm air. And typically we talk about these in terms of which is moving. So I have cold air just sitting here for whatever reason, but I have a warm front. I have warm air moving in. Now what happens is warm air is always less dense than cold air. Cold air condenses, gets denser. So the warm air comes in, it hits the cool air, and it, the cold air goes under and the warm air drives up over the top. So the picture we have here is trying to show that. This warm air mat rises up over the cooler air and as that warm air rises, the cold air is now pushing it up a little faster than it would normally just move. So as it rises, it begins to form layers of clouds at different altitudes. So I'll get various different types of clouds, whether it's cumulus clouds, nimbus clouds, cirrus clouds, way up top, or even like these anvil uh, storm. We tend to get those in the other type of front. But this is a warm front. Warm air is moving in. So like if we're here, we're near the ocean, sort of, but as warm moist air comes in off the ocean, it hits cooler air that's already there, especially maybe it's evening. It hits that cool air and then it begins driving up. And as that warm air rises, it begins to condense and we start to get cloud formation. But this is what occurs in a typical warm front. Alternately, a cold front. We'll put a picture of a cold front here. Now I have warm air that's here. It's over the land, it's already been warming, and I have cold air moving down. This most typically happens in America from, say, air coming down from Canada. It's coming and it's heavy, dense air. So this advancing cold air stays very close to the ground because it's very dense, therefore heavier and it wedges below this warm air. So I have a mass of warm air and my cold front's moving in. Well, as the cold front moves in, it's denser and it wedges under it. And then what I get is this warm air gets pushed up rapidly and I get these very quick towering thunder clouds, kind of these anvil shaped clouds because the cold air is pushing it up very rapidly. So it, raise, it rises carrying all this warm moisture in it rapidly, then it condenses and forms these very big, large thunder clouds. And we can also get with these very high surface winds and thunderstorms. When we talk about thunderstorms coming through, most likely reason a cold front is pushing down, driving the warm air up, so it condenses quickly causing precipitation to fall out, and we tend to get thunderstorms. This is how warm air and cold air masses can affect our weather. Now, atmospheric pressure. We talk about highs and lows. The pressure in the atmosphere in general is greatest right here at the surface, near the Earth's surface, because all the other air is stacked on top of it and it's pushing down. Just like if you've ever gone swimming and you swim to the bottom of a pool or you swim deep down in the lake or the ocean. You know, the deeper you go, the more pressure you're getting on your head. You feel it. That's because literally you have all that water above you pushing down you get greater and greater pressure. Happens in the surface as well with air pressure. We're just used to it so we don't feel it per se. But on the earth, we have higher air pressure. You get up on a mountain, you have less air pressure. And then up in an airplane and you make yourself into the space station, you have virtually no air pressure. There's no air there. So we need the pressure and we're accustomed to it. But it's the greatest at the surface. High pressure air masses, if it's high pressure, well, that's like high density. It's high pressure because lots of particles are packed in together. Like if I blow up a balloon, there's lots of air particles inside the balloon and I open the balloon and the air wants to rush out. It goes from high pressure in the balloon to low pressure outside. So it wants to go out. So high pressure means it's typically dense air. It's been packed in. So I have what happens is I get the air up high and it's cool and cold and dense and it tends to sink down slowly. It also lacks almost any precipitation. So when we have a high, we tend to have beautiful, clear, sunny skies because it's this cold air 
which does not have hardly any moisture in it at all, and it's slowly descending, so we do not have rain. On the other hand, a low pressure system. This consists of low density. It's low density because it's warm. The particles are moving faster. It's not condensed. They're spread out. So it's low pressure. But warm air can hold more water moisture. So I have warm air. The warm air carries more moisture with it and it's less dense. So it's a low pressure system. As that warm air rises, because hot air rises, as the hot air rises, then it begins to cool, so it condenses, and once the water condenses below the dew point, and this can vary for different reasons, the condensation will lead to precipitation. If we're talking about a high pressure system in the area, it's gonna be cloud-free, clear, and sunny, typically. There might be clouds, but largely not. If it's a low pressure system, then we're gonna have warm moist air, we're gonna have lots of clouds, and more than likely we will have rain. The lower the pressure, the more likelihood of having rain. Now the jet stream, like our jet stream coming off the coast of Florida and up the eastern coast of the United States, brings powerful winds, and these jet streams, like the one we have there, but they're all over the planet, they wind up circling the globe. As these pressures circle the globe, we can get some pretty interesting phenomena. Typically, in the northern hemisphere, above the equator, the wind patterns tend to circle in a clockwise direction. So it comes up the eastern seaboard, up Florida, up and around and up, and then it comes up and over and down by Europe in the Atlantic. In the Pacific, it tends to come up and over, say, the Asian side, and then back over down the Pacific Northwest and down through the area. So our Pacific Northwest tends to have more moisture and not as much moisture left over by the time it makes it down to Southern California. Florida and the East Coast, we tend to have a lot of forest. It brings the warm weather or the air. And then as it circles around, we get drier area there. But these are our big, large, patterns in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere it's the exact opposite we'll look at some of the reasons why in a bit now in the pacific we can get an event referred to as the el nino the el nino southern oscillation also known as enso e-n-s-o el nino southern oscillation now the Southern Oscillation is about a two to five year cycle. It doesn't happen every year and it's not guaranteed if you had one this year, you'll have the other. The El Nino is a periodic change in the wind patterns. Typically we have these big ones coming up by Asia over and down. Well, what happens in an El Nino, the thing to remember, it's a warming phase. The Pacific Ocean is warmer than usual. The thermocline drops. We'll take a look up here. The thermocline gets deeper, so I have warmer water in the ocean, and the wind patterns kind of shift. So instead of having this one big, I get a smaller one comes up by the northwest and another one here. So instead of getting this one big cycle, I kind of get two. This affects about two-thirds of the Earth when it occurs. In America, during the El Nino, the Pacific Northwest, as we look at it up here, winds up getting more moisture. It's warmer than usual, and they get more rain. For us in Florida, what we wind up getting is cooler weather than usual, cooler and dry. So if there's an El Nino, the Pacific Northwest knows it's gonna be warmer than usual, but it's gonna be a little cooler than usual for us, and you wind up getting droughts in Australia. The flip coin of the El Nino is the La Nina, and it's a warming. And some years we have normal, some years we have the El Nino, the warming of the Pacific, and other years we can have a La Nina, which is a cooler than usual time in the Pacific. Now let's talk about weather extremes. Those are all things that tend to occur in weather, they're all the time reasonably slow happening. We can usually see them coming, which is what we make our weather predictions based off of. But sometimes we do truly get extreme conditions. Tornadoes and tropical cyclones.
let's look at tornadoes. Tornadoes, for the most part, of occur up in the Midwest of the United States. The United States has more tornadoes than any other country. That area is just particularly prone to it. It's a violent weather event. It always forms over land. What we get is a vertical convection current sucking air upwards. So a convection where the warm air rises and cold air falls. What we have is warm air rises and it comes up and the cold air falls down in the center. So these two conditions together causes the tornado. And it's a collision of this cold front with a warm front. So in the picture you can see here, they're showing the warm air gets drawn in and it begins to spiral upwards the descending cold air is pushing down, and that cool air pushes down into it, cycling around, and we get this huge tornado. And the severe thunderstorms can also trigger multiple tornadoes. Once again, it's these fronts, warm front and a cold front coming together, and in the Midwest is just where we tend to get most of them. Of course, we do get tornadoes occasionally here in Florida when I lived in South Carolina, but the biggest and most violent ones up through the Midwest, Kansas, etc. Also, we get tropical cyclones. Now, here in Florida, we're very familiar with tropical cyclones. Here, we tend to call them hurricanes, and they get referred to as typhoons on the other side of the planet. But it's the same phenomenon. They form over warm water. They have to have water that's at least 80 degrees or more. This is what gives them their strength. They do take a long time to form. So since it's taking a long time to form and gain strength, it gives us time to study them, look at them, make predictions on where they're going. Of course, as we know by the hurricane models, they waver here and there, but we do generally have at least a day or two warning before we know it's really going to hit an area. Usually we have a longer, we know it's coming to this area, but within a day or two out, we can be pretty sure about where it's going to hit. And their intensities are just based on their wind speeds. As we know they can go from a tropical depression to a tropical storm to a hurricane category one through five and the categories are just based on different types of wind speeds. So the picture we have here, the quick little diagram, is just showing as a general rule they swirl in this direction as we've seen up in the northern hemisphere and coming in out of the Atlantic where we call them hurricanes and the warm air spirals inward and then pushes up and out and gets cooler. But they're driven by the warm water in the ocean. This is what gives them their power. And then whether we have a high pressure or a low pressure off of somewhere else can also help dictate and drive where they're going to ultimately go. They tend to follow the ocean currents because that's where they're getting their strength and the power from. And of course, high pressures, low pressures, and these strong prevailing wind currents all help drive a hurricane into its course. But once a hurricane comes into land, it begins to lose strength and power because it's getting it from the warm water. That wraps it up with weather. Take care, and I'll see you next time when we talk about climate.